Today we have a conference on membranes. The objective of a conference is to answer a series of questions using several techniques designed to measure characteristics of membrane proteins. The objective of this video is to describe those several techniques uh, to be used. Membranes are semi-permeable, that is some things go through, other things do not. Sometimes things do not that you need to go through, so you have proteins in the membrane that will facilitate transport uh, in or out of a cell. Now membranes are selective barriers. Some things go in, others do not. And they also regulate uh, traffic ions and macromolecules. That's what you mean by selective barrier. Here we see a red blood cell membrane that shows you the host of different proteins and how the proteins are divided out on the surface of the membrane to facilitate uh, the red blood cell keeping it by concave shape. Now there are some assumptions regarding the membrane conference. Proteinases, labeling systems, and other protein and salt containing treatments usually only act on the proteins exposed to the outside of vesicles as these systems do not normally cross the hydrophobic region of the vesicle membranes. So the hydrophobic region holds them out. Solution, that is protein solubilized in solvent, or remaining proteins may be subjected to SES page electrophoresis. Alterations of exposed proteins during treatment are detected by missing bands or selectively labeled bands in the SES page electrophoresis. Proteins in membranes contain carbohydrates if they're located on the outside of the cell. This could be peripheral proteins, transmembrane proteins, outside integral proteins. Different proteins are exposed to the outside. They will already have been within the Golgi apparatus where sugars are added uh, and so uh, they will have sugars associated with them. There are different locations of proteins. You can have transmembrane proteins, integral protein, peripheral protein, or really some proteins could have uh, a phospholipid tail associated with it. There are types of proteins that we'll be having in our conference today. Transmembrane protein, we have outside integral protein, outside peripheral protein, we have inside integral protein, and inside peripheral protein, and that's the proteins that we'll talk about today. Here we see a red blood cell in different types of solution. Isotonic, it has a biconcave case. Put in a hypotonic solution, uh, and extremely hypotonic, it will lyse the cell. So you can lyse it to get rid of all of the hemoglobin inside, and then you're left with the membrane ghost. And it's a leaky ghost in the beginning, if it hasn't sealed back. Or if it seals back, it becomes a right side out or intact vesicle. If you disturb them before they uh, are no longer are leaky ghosts, before they reseal, sometimes they get confused uh, and turn inside out. So we have inside out vesicles. So the vesicles that we have in the conference that we have today would be intact ones, that is those that resealed, could be leaky ones, that either produced by not yet sealing or that could be produced by Triton X100 treatment. And then you have inside out vesicles where the proteins that are normally on the outside are now on the inside of the vesicle. Now extraction procedures, we have high salt concentration or high pH and that will remove peripheral proteins. So you will solubilize the peripheral proteins with these treatments and then run the gel from the from a solution. Detergents. Triton X100 is a non-ionic detergent. It breaks bonds between lipid and proteins and it makes vesicles leaky. There's also uh, ionic detergent, SDS, sodium dodecyl sulfate, which extracts all membrane proteins. It also solubilizes the proteins for the SDS uh, gel electrophoresis. Now remember, if you put phospholipid uh, in water, it will form micelles. And under certain conditions, it actually forms a phospholipid bilayer like in a membrane. 
when we wash our hands, what happens is the dirt goes into the micelles that are produced by the soap and water combination. When you rinse your hands or rinse your clothes or rinse uh, the dishes after they wash, you're rinsing out the micelles and the dirt uh, associated with that. Similar type thing occurs when you have SDS treatment. SDS solubilizes protein that gives them a net negative charge. So you use these detergents, breaks down the membrane, and little SDS particles bind around uh, the, the protein and makes it soluble. So now you can load the protein on the SDS page. And here you can see the gel electrophoresis uh, where you're loading the proteins on top of the gel and then uh, the proteins itself are negatively charged uh, and they will migrate to the positive charge based on differences in their molecular weight. If they're larger, they migrate less. If they're smaller, they migrate faster. So in the SDS page, you always have to have standards of known molecular weight. Proteins of known size in a standard are run in the same gel as are the unknowns. It's important to run those in the same gel in a different lane. Molecular weight is detected by comparing the migration of the unknown protein with the migration of proteins of known weight in the standard. So labeling techniques and what's visualized, if you run a gel, do not stain it, you will not be able to visualize proteins. If you stain it with Kamasi Blue, it will stain all the proteins on the gel. If you use a uh, fluorography, what happens is then it will label only the radioactive ones. So this is a type of autoradiography uh, to detect uh, these other ones that we, that we have. Um, also, we have carbohydrate labeling systems. Only those with sugars will be used in the carbohydrate label system. Likewise, immunocytochemistry, only those with proteins specific for the antibodies uh, that will be, uh, will be labeled uh, in that system. So if you visualize proteins in a gel, no staining, you can't tell the, where the proteins are. If you Kamasi Blue, it stains all the proteins. If you use some type of radioactive detecting system, only those that are radioactive will see. Carbohydrate labeling, only those with sugars will be seen. Um, immunocytochemistry, only those with proteins of antigens corresponding to specific antibodies will be seen. So if you use lactoperoxidase and 125, lactoperoxidase attaches to proteins outside the membrane that have, have tyrosine residues. Most proteins have tyrosine residues. Once it attaches to the lactoperoxidase, then the I-125, the radioactivity, can bind to the lactoperoxidase. And then you visualize that by fluorography. Namely, it's like an autoradiography where you have your, your gel with the protein already migrated through and you put a photographic emulsion on top of that to be able to detect uh, radioactivity where the band is. So, if you use lactoperoxidase and 125 labeling of protein A and D, but not B and C, then what you see with Kamasi Blee is all the proteins. They're all there. But with fluorography, you only see those that are radioactive. So another labeling technique is carbohydrates, and we'll see the different types of carbohydrates here in the next slide or so. So you can use that with electro, gel electrophoresis, microscopy, or also affinity chromatography. Another labeling procedure is to uh, use protease enzymes, which reduces the size of the protein. So that alters the number of bands and the location in the SDS gel. So in this case, you're actually destroying the protein with the enzyme, and that protein will be missing where it should be in the gel. Another way of detecting things is by immunocytochemistries. Uh, antibodies bind and label specific proteins that are in the gel is what you have. So treatment of exposed proteins, uh, C and D, with prolytic enzymes will make the C and D removed from the gel. If you stain both of those with Kamasi Blue, you would only see the proteins 
uh, A and B because they were not treated with the, with the prolytic enzyme uh, uh, C and D were and they are no longer in the gel. Carbohydrates are on proteins that are on outside. Could be transmembrane, could be outside uh, integral protein, uh, could be peripheral proteins. All those proteins were exposed to the inside of the Golgi apparatus where carbohydrates are added. Uh, and whenever they came out and become part of the membrane of the outside of a cell, they brought those carbohydrates with them. There's a, a different types of plant lectins that you could use to detect specific types of sugars. A glucose, a fucose, a different ones are there. You can use the different ones on there to detect the sugars and the proteins. So if you use a plant lectin uh, on a B and D, but not A and C, then if you take those, take that gel, run that gel, do it with Kamasi Blue, you see all four of them. But if you use a carbohydrate labeling, you only label those that have the sugars attached to them, which would be B and D. So in terms of your overall approach, you start out with these different vesicles. Uh, could be intact, could be leaky, or inside out. And so you set up these different types of vesicles. Then you treat the vesicles. Run the gel electrophoresis to measure the size of the protein based on molecular weight. Then you use flography to detect the presence of radioactivity. You also use carbohydrate labeling system, if appropriate, to detect sugars, and you can use immunocytochemistry to detect specific proteins uh, uh, in the gel if they happen to be present. So here we see the, the conference on membranes. Uh, you see the different proteins that we're uh, dealing with. Uh, this is uh, ET's blood, so they have kind of related protein names uh, like um, uh, finger nectin and Elliot 1 and 2, extra T. Uh, all those are cute names that Dr. Snell had produced uh, back at, at uh, um, University of Texas Health Science Center uh, in, uh, in Dallas. So you see a host of different uh, procedures you could use and then it ends up with the specific questions. How would you determine if proteins are integral or peripheral? How would you determine if the proteins are exposed to the outside or inside? How would you determine if proteins are transmembrane? And how would you determine whether or not the proteins are glycosylated? And if so, which side of the plasma membrane they have become glycosylated? So those are the membrane procedures that we want to use for our conference. Good luck.